Awakeful morning in the bowl of night Has flung the stone that put the stars to flight And lo, the hunter of the east has caught the sultan's turret in a noose of line. Dreaming when dawn's left hand was in the sky, I heard a voice within the tavern cry. Awake, my little ones, and feel, O oh God, before life's liquor in its cup be dry. A moon of my delight that knows no way. The moon of heaven is rising once again. How oft hereafter rising shall she look in this same garden after me in vain. So good morning once again. Um, I'm Bhagavati. <laughs> and this is Ramesha. And we're very, very happy to be here offering service for you today. And so now I'd like to read um, from Rays of the One Light, Weekly Commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita by Swami Kriyananda. And this week's topic is, Did God Create the Universe or Become It? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, contains a passage that explains the essential truth that creation is a process of becoming. The universe is not separate from God the Creator, but a part of Him, even as our own dream creations during sleep are fig figments of our consciousness. God's is the life, God's the reality. Not a melody could be composed, not a poem written, were the melody and the poem not already there, simply waiting to be expressed. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Ego-directed desire is like static, it distorts the radioed messages of infinity. But the pristine impulse from the divine, undistorted by limitation and delusion, is the life that gives rise to all that is. As the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad, Bhagavad Gita states, I am the fluidity of water. I am the silver light of the moon and the golden light of the sun. I am the Om chanted in all the Vedas. The cosmic sound moves, moving as if soundlessly through the ether. I am the, manly, I am the manliness of men. I am the good, sweet smell of the moist earth. I am the luminescence of life, the sustaining life of all living creatures. I am self-offering in those who would expand their little lives into cosmic life. O oh, Arjuna, know me as the eternal seed of all creatures. In the perceptive, I am their perception. In the great, I am their greatness. 
in the glorious, it is I who am their glory. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. A few days ago, um, January 5th, we celebrated uh, our gurus uh, Paramhansa Yogananda's birthday. So I think I would like to talk about this a little bit and just, um, I don't know, just um, say a few words about this incredible person that Yogananda was and still is. And I will first play a little excerpt from um, one of his birthdays. He talks a little bit, he gives a very sweet, um, he acknowledges people's love and affection that they demonstrate to him. And then, um, just to put it in context, just so you know what's happening, at some point somebody brings in a birthday cake and he makes some funny remarks about it and you'll hear it, it's really charming. So, it's, it's, a, it's really amazing when we listen to these talks to realize how humble Master was in everything he did. He did incredible things in this country and throughout his life, which was not a long one. He lived 59 years. But um, he came with this special dispensation, which was, uh, it had so many facets. And we probably are uh, familiar with a few of them and, you know, teaching meditation, teaching Kriya Yoga uh, are the most uh, obvious ones. He started this incredible uh, organization, Self-Realization Fellowship, and had initiated uh, over 100,000 people into Kriya Yoga in his life. That's a lot of people. And um, he had what he called his spiritual campaigns. He traveled through the country and gave a lot of lectures and thousands of people would go and listen to him. Uh, he lectured in the main uh, places like Carnegie Halls and places like that. And um, he had great success. And that was more in the first part of his life. He had this mission of going out, let people know about these teachings and really stir up the energy and just let people know, hey, there's this. You should know about this, and I'm telling you about it, and I'm demonstrating. He performed many, many miracles just to get people's attention, and he really did get people's attention. And um, there's one of them that comes to mind, uh, which was um, Dayamata, who later became uh, the president of Self Realization Fellowship until last year when she passed away. And he, she was from uh, Salt Lake City in Utah and Master was lecturing there and she came to Master's lecture and uh, her whole face were, was covered in bandages because she had some illness that I don't know exactly what it was but she, she, she had scars and, and all that. And, and so Master saw her and called her out and he told her that in seven days, he was gonna be there for a whole week and he said in seven days uh, you, you'll be healed. You won't need any bandages anymore. And then when he tells the story he said, he said well, I, I, I thought I, I was in trouble. I had better make it happen for real because otherwise <laughs> I would have had to leave, the, to leave town quickly. <laughs> and of course, of course, you know, it happened and she became one of his disciples. But that's the kind of thing that he used to do in those years. And, Forming things and it, it was just to really attract uh, people's attention and he was always hoping by doing that to not uh, attract to not draw attention to himself but to let people know and make them understand that there is a power there is a power behind all of us and it can be known this power can be known through 
specific and scientific uh, teachings and techniques that he brought. And this mission, this big mission, was a direct answer to uh, Jesus Christ's wish to send somebody to the West to remind people about the core message of his teachings, which is intimate and direct communion with God. Uh, something that is not very known, but Jesus actually appeared, which is something that we say every Sunday in the festival, and you'll hear it later, but Jesus appeared to this master, Babaji, and he asked him, you know, the church has done beautiful things. They have done incredible good to people in spreading the gospel, in helping others and all that, but they have forgotten the most important thing, direct communion with God. So we have to send somebody to the West and remind them about this because this is the most important part of my teachings. And that's how Yogananda was chosen to be that one. And he called his uh, movement here, he called it the second coming of Christ. And not because he was boasting about anything, but he knew that what, what he was bringing was um, a new and be more clear explanation of what Jesus' teachings really were. Because the meaning of them, some part of it, had been forgotten over the centuries. And that's why he uh, wrote an extensive and very beautiful commentary on all the Gospels uh, over the years. He also wrote a beautiful commentary on the Bhagavad Gita. He said that those two are the main scriptures, and part of his mission was to give an interpretation of those two scriptures and show that they basically teach the same thing, but also to make them more easily accessible to people in this era, and that's what he did. But um, his impact on the society in general was and has been amazing. He was so concerned with uplifting people's consciousness in general and improving people's lives, not just from the spiritual point of view, but also to very trivial things. I mean, he was the one who invented the, the what's it called? <laughs> the toilet seat cover. I mean, you would think an avatar has better things to think about, but instead, he was so concerned about making people's life better. And um, so that's uh, a little uh, funny to think about, but that's actually what happened. So um, he, something that really amazes me, I listened lately to um, another talk that he gave where he explains the whole, how it actually happened that he made the decision to come to the West and teach. So we all know this, if you have read uh, Autobiography of a Yogi, he tells the story, but he doesn't go quite into details as much as he does in this talk that I'm talking about. And so he was in his school in Ranchi, he was meditating, and he had this vision of all these people, and he recognized those people were Americans, and um, later on, he could recognize instantly when he came to the country, when he met those people, he could recognize them instantly and know that this person is supposed to be, will become a disciple. And that's how, even in the later, later years, a few months before he passed away, somebody, somebody um, asked him, so did all the disciples that you saw in those visions, did they all come? He said, almost all of them, just a few left, they will come. And they did in the last few months of his life. But um, he had this vision between 10 and 11 in the morning. He was at that time the headmaster of the school in Ranchi that he himself had founded. And uh, right after the vision, he called all the teachers. He gave them instructions to, about how to run the school and all that. 
put them all in charge of everything and left. By three o'clock in the afternoon of that same day, he was riding on the train, going to Calcutta, getting ready to leave. I mean, can you imagine that? Leaving everything behind in a few hours, knowing that he might not come back. Well, he probably knew he was going to because he was a master. But still, it's, it takes a lot of courage. He didn't know English as well back then. He knew a little bit, but not quite as much. He had never lectured in English. But he went straight to his guru, Sri Yukteswar, and asked, is this real? Uh, is this true? Am I supposed to go? And Sri Yukteswar said, all doors are open. It's now or never. And so, OK, this is what I'm going to do. So he was trying to get his own, um, is cabin the right word for a boat? OK. Uh, to get his own cabin on this first boat that uh, arrived after, um, I think it was World War I, right? It was the first boat going to America from India right after the war. And it was really hard to get a passport. It was really hard to you know, get even a place on that boat because it was full. And, but Master had a, kind of an argument with the guy at the office where he was trying to book a place on this boat. And, and the guy said, oh, you'll never be able to be on that boat. He said, write my name down. If somebody cancels, that will be my cabin. And finally, he said, like, OK. And then he said, but you need a passport. There's no way you can get a passport in less than six months. He said, you write down my name. I'll take care of the passport. <laughs> and so he, <laughs> he went to his father's house and told him about these things. And his father was horrified about his son going all the way to America. I mean, that was 1920. It's not like today that one flies to America and hopefully comes back sometimes. But, um, and his father said, well, you know, your uncle is a magistrate. He might help you with the passport. And so he went, see, saw his uncle. His uncle provided the passport. And then master went back to the, the office guy Without, without letting, he didn't tell him at first that he had a passport. And he said, so, is there a place for me? And the guy said, well, you don't have a passport. Tell me if there's a place for me. But you don't have a passport. Tell me if there's a place for me. And he said, yes, somebody canceled. But you don't have a passport. And he took the passport. He <laughs> said, so, here, put my name down. I'm going to be on that boat. And, and that's how it, it happened. And, and one more thing I, I want to say, uh, his father, who was a disciple of um, Lahiri Mahashaya. He was also a Kriya, a Kriya yogi, and he had been for many years. But as you can imagine, he was very reluctant to let his son go. And uh, he said, he told him, but how, wh how are you going to do this? You don't have any money. And in fact, he didn't have any money when he s told the guy to write his name down. He didn't know how the heck he was going to pay for it. But but Master said, yes, it's true, I don't have any money, but God will provide the money because I am supposed to go. And then he said, well, maybe God will suggest you to help me because his father was actually quite uh, wealthy. And his father said, never, I will never help you that way. And he left. And then the next morning, before his father, before going to the office, left a check with Master's sister with a large amount of money. And Master um, saw the check, went to his father, and said, I don't want your money because I, I'm afraid that I just you know, forced you to do this. And he said, no, you didn't. God changed my heart. And uh, I give you this money not as your father, but as a disciple of Lahiri Mahashaya. Go to the West. Bring the teachings of the great masters of India. And this is my contribution. So that was an incredible act of generosity and sweetness that allowed Master to come here and all of us, by extension, to learn all these incredible teachings and live by them. So um, I was thinking that, you know, the topic that Bhagavati read today about did God become the universe or did God create the universe or become it? In a sense, I was thinking, well, God has become everything and all of us. 
But in a, in a certain sense, uh, a master embodies God better than anything and anybody else. And I was thinking, well, why is that? And I think it's because God was able to become a master without any resistance. There was no resistance there on the part of the master to say, yeah, I want you to become me, but I actually still like that and doing that. And you know, it reminds me of a prayer. I think it was St. Augustine. He said, God, I really, really want you, but not quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how uh, many of us feel sometimes. You know, we are here because we are interested. We, we, we want to know God, but then there is still another part of our mind in our mind that we think, yeah, but you know, I maybe if I have God, then I will have to give up this little thing and that little thing that I really like, and, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. And so, and this is why God doesn't become us so instantaneously as He becomes Yogananda or Sri Yukteswar or Jesus Christ. But we have in potential. We are already He. That's the thing. It's just that we don't let that flow freely through us. And this is what uh, just, this is our trouble, you know, that uh, that's why we're still in delusion and trying to figure it out. But a master is completely free and open. And not to say that, uh, you know, we're trying to, to be humble and, and, you know, Swami Kriyananda said that a real true humility is not to pretend that we're small, you know, and just shrink and say, oh, no, I, I can't really do this. I'm t too small, you know. But it's actually to recognize and to be aware at all times that uh, it's, it is not us. We are not doing anything. God is doing it through us. Master, when he created, you know, his organization, when he taught, when he did all that he did, he was really humble about it, but he was humble in the sense that he totally knew that God was flowing through him at all times. And this is why he was able in such a short amount of time to do so many things and to touch so many people. Um, even, though, um, even though he was at times with his disciples, you know, he had to train them. So he had to be the master, he had to be the teacher, and sometimes he would scold them. But it was, it was always with great, great, great love. And I think this is the reason why, uh, to this day, there's so many people who love Yogananda. I, I have the great joy to be uh, doing a little, little work with uh, the Yogananda movie that it's been produced here in Los Angeles. For those of you who don't know, there's a, um, they are producing a movie on the life of Yogananda, which will come out, I think, in 2012? 13? 13? Yeah. Okay. Feature. Yes, feature film. I don't know what that means, but feature film. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and uh, and I my my little job is to um, we have a Facebook page, so I post something every day, a quote from Master. And by the way, if you haven't liked it, go like it. It's really cool. Uh, it's called Yogananda the movie, the little side. And um, so on the day of, of Yogananda's birthday on Thursday, I posted a nice quote, a nice poem, and a nice picture. And as always, there's a lot of people who write comments and stuff. As of yesterday, there were 54 comments on that page. <coughs> and just reading those comments was so moving. And I just copied a few of them. I want to read them to you because I, it really made me realize, oh my god, there are so many people who love Yogananda. I had no idea. I mean, we're used to our friend devotees in Ananda. I, I, you know, you know, there's a lot of people, but but when you read comments like these, really from the heart, you really realize how 
big of an impact Master has been having for all these years since he came to the country until today. So these are just a few of them. Happy birthday, dear Yogi. Love you, and I'm thankful for you. Another one says, Happy birthday, God. And another one, Happy birthday, my Lordy, Lordy, divine love. And another one, Guruji, the love you have given can't be expressed. Happy birthday. And another one, Happy birthday, Yoganandaji. No words can, no words to describe about him. Love you, Guruji. Some of the English is a little funny because they're not from this country, but still. Happy birthday. Your words always make my heart sing. Divine blessings. Your words sing to my soul. I am so blessed to have you in my life. I shall be thine always. May your bliss shine in our hearts. Happy joyous day, Guruji. Beautiful spirit that walked the earth. Paramhansa Yogananda, incarnation of love. Happy birthday. And one that was particularly touching. Only love can take my place, were the last words of our beloved Guru. So let's spread love and be connected with our Guru forever. So there's a lot more. You can just go and read them yourself. It's really quite amazing. And, uh, and how, how can this happen? You know, Master passed away in 1952, 1952 and it's been, what, 60, anyway few years and <laughs> and uh, um, but there's an increasing number of people interested in his teachings interested in um, what he taught and brought and especially feeling personally connected with him which is amazing because you know it's hard in general for people to feel connected to somebody who's not physically in the body anymore but such was his uh, magnetism and uh, the, especially the love behind everything that he did and said that people can help but uh, feel it and appreciate it and uh, f feel like they're part of it and they're connected with it so um, we are all of us that we are here and we are connected with Yogananda and you know, this is not to uh, say that other teachers or other gurus or other paths are not equally good. Uh, it's just recognizing that you know, this particular one that we're talking about here is an incredible path. And Yogananda really was an incarnation of God in the sense that he was such so pure. He said, I killed Yogananda a long time ago. Nobody but God now dwells in this temple. And that was not just to boast. He was totally feeling that every word, every action, every thought he had were not his, but God's. And he showed that over and over again in his life. So I'd like to end with um, a poem that he wrote. And uh, if you want, you can close your eyes and um, and just feel the love and the joy behind these words. I come to tell you all of him and the way to encase him in your bosom and of the discipline which brings his grace. To those of you who have asked me to guide you to my beloved's presence, I will warn you through my silently talking mind or speak to you through a gentle, signif significant glance, or whisper to you through my love, or loudly dissuade you when you stray away from him. But when I shall become only a memory, or a mental image, or silently speaking voice, when no earthly call will ever reveal my whereabouts in unplumbed space, when no shallow entreaty or stern stentorian command will bring an answer from me. I will smile in your mind when you are right, and when you are wrong, I will weep through my eyes. 
dimly peering at you in the dark and weep through your eyes perchance and I will whisper to you through your conscience and I will reason with you through your reason and I will love through your love when you are able no longer to talk to me read my whispers of eternity eternally through that I will talk to you unknown I will walk by your side and guard you with invisible arms and as soon as you know my beloved and hear his voice in silence you will know me again more tangibly than you knew me in this earth plane and yet when I'm only a dream to you I will come to remind you that you too are not but a dream of my heavenly beloved and when you know you are a dream as I know now we all will be we all will be ever awake in him God bless you Love is all I know, sun rays on the snow of a winter long in darkness without song. Oh, my heart's a fire burning all desire, only you remain. And life again. Too long I did stray, flung lifetimes away, imagined you did not care. I know now your smile was mine all the while. I listened and love was there. I can't breathe for love of the stars above call to me come home life's waves are land in foam only love can heal all the pain I feel, what a fool was I to turn away. Love is all I know, sun rays on the snow of a winter long in darkness without song. Oh, my heart's a fire burning all desires, only you remain. And life again. Too long I did stray, flung lifetimes away, imagined you did not care. I know now your smile was mine all the while. I listened. And love was there. I can't breathe for love. All the stars above call to me, come home. Life's waves are land in foam. Only love can heal. All the pain I feel, what a fool was.
was I to turn away?